Good evening, everyone. My name is Adrian Blackwell. I've been teaching at Waterloo Architecture for the past nine years, and I'll be moderating tonight's event with Mona Dye, um, who is an adjunct professor at Waterloo Architecture, teaching in third year and an active member of Open Architecture Collaborative and the Architecture Lobby Toronto. Thanks for coming to the first conversation of the 2021 Winter Waterloo Air Architecture Aircraft Speaker Series, What is Solidarity? As we begin today's lecture, it's important that we recognize the territory of our School of Architecture occupies. The University of Waterloo is situated on the Haldeman Tract, a swath of land 10 kilometers on either side of the Grand River. This land was promised to the Haudenosaunee of the Six Nations of the Grand River and is within the traditional territory of the neutral Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee peoples. The subject of tonight's conversation is the fundamental right of people to continue living in the social and ecological milieu that they inhabit. One of the most fundamental transgressions of this right occurred during colonialism, when indigenous people in the lands now named Canada and in other colonized, colonized parts of the world were forced from their lands. Any project of housing justice must acknowledge this original dispossession and work in solidarity with indigenous land defenders to decolonize land. At the same time, struggles around the right to remain have much to learn from Indigenous understandings of land, which are entirely opposed to the speculative logic of Canadian property law. The central question that the speaker series asks is, how can we as architects and designers participate in collective long-term social movements and advocate within and beyond our professional obligations? Over the fall term, this series welcomed activists, researchers, and designers and artists tied to social movements demanding Indigenous land sovereignty, disability justice, and the abolition of police and prisons. This winter term, there are three more events. Tonight's event on the right to remain, a second on anti-extractivism, and a final event on food sovereignty. Each of these discussions have been linked to student-led workshops designed to facilitate deeper conversations about how solidarities might resonate within our school and beyond. The three workshops in the fall term were powerful events. Please stay tuned for information about future workshops related to this winter series. Um, the What is Solidarity series is coordinated by faculty members Adrian Blackwell and Jane Hutton and graduate students Mary Paranthahan, Vic Mantha Blythe, Jade Manbod, and Nicole Rack, who are representatives of Treaty Lands Global Stories, Bridge, and the Sustainability Collective. Uh, thanks to Ariscraft for funding this speaker series. And I'm going to ask Mona to introduce the right to remain. Yeah, uh, thank you everyone for joining. Um, hope you're well. Uh, so I think it's a cliche now to say that COVID-19 has exacerbated pre-existing inequalities in our cities. In many cities, like where I am in Toronto, the pandemic has and is most severely affecting people who are precariously housed. There is a flood of evictions as job losses due to the pandemic uh, and the lifting of Ontario's eviction moratorium this summer have made it even more impossible for many to pay rent in a city that has already been unaffordable, become unaffordable through decades of public disinvestment and housing. The architectural discipline has ignored its own complicity in the systems and mechanisms that cause eviction and displacement for far too long. In Toronto and Vancouver, the profession has profited from the construction of luxury condos, bespoke single family homes, and celebrated the reactivation of neighborhoods without really questioning who knew development benefits and who it harms. Architecture workers and everyone else with any power to shape the city must now ask ourselves how we can sincerely support tenants and other precariously housed people's right to remain. So members of Vancouver's Right to Remain Collective describes this term as the existential right to be free from oppression, the material right to the basic necessities of life, the cultural right to sustain a community, and the political right to access democratic mechanisms that protect human rights. So today we're joined by three speakers who are here to discuss the right to remain. Um, Yogi Acharya, former organizer with um, the Ontario Coalition Against Poverty. Audrey Kobayashi, uh, PhD and fellow of the Royal Society of Canada. 
um, as well as Patricia Montreux, Distinguished University Professor and Queen's Research Chair. Um, and finally, uh, Geraldine Denning, uh, who is lead architect and co-founder of Architects for Social Housing UK. Um, so I'll start by introducing Yogi. Um, Yogi Acharya is a former organizer with uh, the Ontario Coalition Against Poverty. Um, he's been a longtime housing activist. And thanks to an introduction through Adrian, I had the privilege of working with Yogi OCAP, um, as well as a team of allied academics and activists on a proposal that was issued in 2019 to pressure the city to expropriate a series of vacant lots um, in Toronto's downtown east uh, for the purposes of rent geared to income housing. Um, so this is part of OCAP's uh, continuing work to fight the displacement of vulnerable residents from Toronto's downtown. So in addition, Yogi has organized many direct actions to pressure local governments to do more to address homelessness in the city, uh, to protect individual residents' rights to adequate housing, um, and to draw attention to urban inequality. He's written extensively to advocate for more equitable housing policy um, in Toronto. Um, and so thank you for joining us today to share your thoughts and your work on the right to remain. Well, thanks a lot, uh, Mona, and thanks to all the organizers of this event, and um, thanks to all of you who are watching today. Um, as part of my time here, I do want to focus on the collaboration that Mona referenced, um, that Adrian uh, was also a part of, and as were other members of uh, Open Architecture Collaborative, which is an organization um, that Mona is a part of, but is that works on projects such as this. and. I understand a lot of the participants in the project were also graduates of uh, the architecture program that many of you are in now. So um, it's nice to be able to share uh, what people have done back with the school that produced many of these graduates. Um, so as Mona also referenced, I um, for five years I was an organizer at the Ontario Coalition Against Poverty. I uh, have since uh, moved from Toronto and live in another province now. Um, for 30 years, OCAP, the Ontario Coalition Against Poverty, has worked in the downtown east end of Toronto uh, and fought for poor and homeless people who live in the city and the province more broadly, and has always played this dual role between being a provincial advocate on behalf of people who are uh, poor and homeless, uh, but also played a role as an organization that defends the neighborhood in which it is situated. And that for OCAP has been the, uh, the neighborhood of the downtown East End in Toronto. Now, historically, for those of you who may not be as familiar with uh, Toronto, it's a neighborhood that has sat um, sort of sandwiched between the industrial, the historically industrial south end of the city uh, along, the, the long, along the waterfront and the affluent neighborhood of Rosedale, which lies to the north. And as a result, has been a neighborhood that for generations has housed uh, poor and homeless people or poor people in the area. And increasingly uh, over the last few decades, people who are rendered homeless as a result of uh, uh, our housing policies and a lack of other infrastructures that people uh, need to rely on, especially in times of crisis. Um, I have a few uh, photographs and slides to, or slides, uh, photographs really to share with you in order to help uh, show you some of uh, the things that I'm going to be talking about. So the screen you see in front of you is the title page of the report that uh, the collaboration Mona referenced before generated. It's a report uh, that through an extensive period of consultation with the local community uh, created a proposal for building between 150 to 260 units of publicly owned rent geared to income housing um, in the downtown east end of Toronto. And the site uh, chosen for this particular mobilization, of this particular development proposal, I mean, um, is 214 to 230 uh, Sherburne Street. Um, there are a series of seven vacant properties. Here's another look of what it looks like on the on the street. It's a series of seven vacant properties uh, uh, that lie at the southwest intersection of the 
uh, southwest intersection of Dundas and Sherburn. For 50 years, uh, three houses on that lot uh, served as rooming houses um, for poor people in the neighborhood. And about 10 years ago, two of those houses were demolished. So that's the green space you see to the left of the big house there, leaving just the big house standing, 230 Sherburn. The reason that house still remains standing is because it was designated as heritage by uh, the city and the owners could not uh, demolish it. That's a 30 room house that for the past 10 years now has sat vacant. This is the intersection of Dundas and Sherburn that you see. The big house that you were just looking at is on the left here in the image. And directly across from it is the All Saints uh, Church that uh, for generations now has operated a drop-in center for uh, homeless people. Uh, lots of homeless people gather there during the day. The intersection of Dundas and Sherburn is infamous in Toronto because it does have a big concentration of street homelessness, very visible homelessness that you see when you drive or walk past that intersection. And the reason for that is because over the generations that poor and homeless poor people have lived in, in the downtown East End, they have fought to build infrastructure that people need in order to survive. So that includes things like the drop-in center that currently runs at the All Saints Community Center that you see there. Directly adjacent to that center that you don't see in the image is a respite site that the city ran for uh, years before it shut down last, uh, last winter. And that was shut down under pressure from the Neighborhood Association. So that's another story of the impacts of um, incoming gentrification that we can get into a bit later. Uh, across from this on the Dundas Street side is uh, Street Health, a clinic that serves homeless people in that neighborhood. Uh, there is a women's shelter not too far away from here, one of the biggest shelters in Toronto that currently has beds for about 600 people is not too far away, about two blocks east, uh, sorry, two blocks west of here is where that's located. So the area has a lot of poor and homeless people and street homelessness is very visible here. And the significance of these properties then is that they lie directly in a neighborhood where people are struggling to survive and enduring the harsh realities of living on the street on a daily basis. And every single day that they're doing that, they're watching these properties lie vacant, lying the places where they could, that could be used as homes and that indeed did serve as homes for many poor people for generations lie vacant. So mobilizations around uh, 214, 230 Sherburn have a long history. The project Mona talked about and that I'll discuss in greater detail has been a more recent part of that mobilization. In the 1980s, for instance, a woman by the name of Drina Joubert uh, froze to death. Uh, shelters were full as they are today and she couldn't get into any other uh, a place for the night and she slept in a pickup truck at the back of this the big house that you see there, the 230 Sherburn house, and she froze to death that night. Subsequent mobilizations created uh, enough pressure on the city to create about 3,000 units of uh, singles housing. So that's housing specifically designed, rent geared to income social housing, specifically designed for single adults. Right behind All Saints Church, again, not seen in the picture, is our 61 units uh, that were part of those 3,000 uh, units of housing. They continue to serve as housing for people to this day, including many members of OCAP who currently live in those buildings. In 2013, I'll get to this image in a second, but in 2013, um, uh, three years after the properties had been lying vacant, OCAP organized uh, protest marches uh, at that property in order to get it converted to public housing um, and for the city to come in and purchase those properties. Um, there was an overnight occupation followed by multiple marches and uh, talks with the city councillor in order to move things forward, but things didn't move forward. Then um, in 2018, so that's about two years ago, three years ago now, uh, this sign went up, a for sale sign goes up on the property. Uh, through some investigative work, um, we were able to find out that the owners of the property who are known uh, slum lords in the city. They own numerous other delinquent properties that they rent out to primarily poor people at exorbitant rates and keep the properties under quite abysmal conditions. Um, the owners of this property wanted to sell. Now, when we mobilized in order to get city councillors to 
expressed interest on the city's behalf in purchasing those properties, it, they quickly took it off the market and the for sale sign was off. Um, we found out that the developers wanted to hold out, the city would pay them fair market value, which is substantial given its location and encroaching gentrification. In fact, in this picture, you can see very well what we mean by encroaching gentrification. Those are all towers that were under construction two years ago. They're all completed now. And in fact, more permits have been applied for and more towers are being planned for uh, areas that are coming encroaching even closer and closer to this particular site. Um, so in 2018, we started mobilizing in a more uh, immediate, in a more on a more immediate, uh, uh, on a more immediate basis, in order to get these properties taken over by the city. So the call has been for the city to purchase them, and if the owners won't relent and sell the property to the city, then to expropriate them. And for those of you who may not be familiar with the notion of expropriation, that's when the city essentially forces a sale. That's when the city says to the owner, you have no option but to sell this property to us. And the owners get fair market value for it, often in fact more than fair market value for the properties that they are sold. And the city does this all the time for transit projects, for example, and very rarely for building uh, shelters and such like. And in this case, we were saying that this infrastructure project of public housing is as significant and essential as any transit project could be and that the city needs to go on and and start uh, doing so and start with this site in particular given its historical significance and given that people uh, living in that neighborhood desperately needed public housing. So over the uh, two years that followed numerous actions took place at the site. Here's one action that we did where we created a notice board <laughs> A very similar to the uh, you know change has been proposed for the site a development impending development sign that city of toronto puts up uh, when a development has been applied for just one second sorry about that i don't know why that happened is the screen still being shared yes okay thank you and how many minutes do i have left um five a little less than five maybe okay um here's the notice put up at the site as part of an action uh in order to indicate to the city that we were serious about pursuing this and uh that actions would continue until the city uh would go ahead and purchase this particular site here's another action that happened shortly before we commenced on the project with uh, mona and adrian uh, a bunch of earth was taken from the site in a symbolic act of expropriation and was delivered to uh, City Hall. <laughs> Sorry. Um, okay, which brings me to the project with uh, Mona and Adrian and other members of the Open Architecture Collaborative. So the, in, the idea behind this was to create, in fact, a design proposal that could be submitted to the city. And in order to do so, we organized a series of uh, information gathering sessions where along, along with the architects uh, and the architect interns who are part of the group, we designed uh, a series of feed, feedback questions in order to get input from people in the neighborhood about what kind of housing would be most essential uh, for that neighborhood. So we got feedback on the overall building form and we presented different options, as you can see there. We got uh, ideas from people around uh, programming that could be run on the podium level uh, in order to assist people with what would be necessary needs. Uh, we got input on public space qualities and we also got input on domestic space qualities. And the end result of that uh, was the creation of what you see in front of you there. The proposal to create um, housing, like as I mentioned before, between 150 to 260 units of publicly owned rent geared to income housing that would be spread across a podium and then a tower, the tower to contain most of the units of housing and the podium to carry uh, programming um, of the kind that I described before, whether that be a health uh, community health clinic and overdose prevention site, perhaps a low cost meal program, so on and so forth. Uh, a, a cardboard model of this was created by uh, members of the group and then uh, presented to uh, City Hall at a press conference that was organized. The, the event uh, gathered substantial coverage in the media and spurred a series of uh, initiatives from the city uh, that with a lot of push from below 
in order to assess the acquisition potential of this site. COVID meant that a lot of the things that had come due were suddenly pushed back indefinitely. And we're currently, OCAP is currently in the process of following up on some of those. And we're expecting an update in about two weeks time about what the city is willing to do in terms of either purchasing the site. We understand that negotiations are underway with now with the, uh, with the owners. And uh, if they're not willing to sell what the city is willing to do on, on the expropriation front. So I'll conclude by saying this, that um, to me, what this project signified, especially in this context where architects uh, these days upon graduation are so often forced into creating housing for the wealthy because alternatives to that simply aren't being built. So in that context, to me, what was powerful was for this group of architects and architect interns to come together to create actually a proposal, a conceptual proposal for uh, developing housing that would actually transform that particular neighborhood, not at the expense of its most vulnerable residents, but in fact, uh, for their benefit, that the neighborhood would move forward, but take them along with them. And to me, that was a dramatically different vision than what the current uh, onslaught of gentrification provides for poor and working class people in our city. And that to me is the power of that sort of collaboration, something that I hope uh, many of you upon graduation will, will pursue. Um, I'll, I'll leave it there for now. I had a video to show that was Adrian and Mona talking at that particular press conference, but given time constraints, I'll leave it. Perhaps if there's time later, uh, either of you can chime in and, and talk about your sense of, uh, of that project. I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thanks so much, Yogi. Um, our next speaker is Audrey Kobayashi, who has been involved in participatory community research for more than 40 years. Uh, she has researched and published in the areas of human rights and social justice, anti-racism, employment equity, and immigration. For the past decade, she has worked closely with colleague Jeff Masuda and a team of community researchers to improve housing conditions in the single residence occupancy buildings in Vancouver's downtown east, where she is also engaged in community center projects on art, poetry, and music. The slogan, Right to Remain, emerged during this collaborative research. Uh, Audrey, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you, Adrian and Mona. I'm, I'm just delighted to be here and to be part of this remarkable series. Uh, and Mona, I was really uh, surprised and delighted to hear you read something that Jeff Masuda and I had co-authored about our project, The Right to Remain, which is a participatory uh, activist uh, collaborative project in the downtown east side of Vancouver and there are so many parallels and similar things going on between Vancouver and Toronto right now that uh, I'd love to explore but we won't have time tonight maybe later in the questions. Uh, I'm going to focus today on the role of the resident participants activists uh, in this project. And I'll begin by acknowledging that the project occurs in what is now Vancouver on the unceded lands of the Musqueam, Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh nations. Uh, and, th and that is more than a symbolic acknowledgement as will become clear. I'll start by reading uh, from my messenger page yesterday. Uh, this is a series of messages that took place over a few hours in what would have been afternoon in Vancouver. Hey gang, Richard and I just finished all our buildings. We got the Hilden, Avalon, United Rooms and Wonder Rooms, spoke to all the managers who were friendly and supportive. Oh, and I actually bumped into Brendan from Colonial Rooms and gave him a poster too. We just finished too, no problems getting in. We got Arno, London, West and Cobalt. Nicole also took some for Kiefer Rooms. Emoji, emoji, gif, emoji. These are flashing across the screen. Hearts going up. You have to imagine this. Thank you for all your wonderful work. I already got one recoup call, but I couldn't take it. Please let me know if you need any support setting up the automated reviewing system. Emoji, emoji. No worries. We can see the phone number that the call came from the Grasshopper app or the web page and return the call. Thanks for all the work you're doing. We had fun and wow, there are so many beautiful historical photographs 
in the hallway walls of the Hilden. And Tom and I got the lion and summer done. Couldn't get hold of James at Empress and Afton has a COVID scare right now. So we'll have to go when it's safe. Fantastic work, everyone. I wish we could be there. Emoji, emoji, emoji. OK, this uh, uh, this was a number of voices. I blended them all together. A very prosaic everyday exchange on what's going on uh, among our researchers, tenant researchers in the project, the right to remain. So uh, Mona actually read our premise that people have the right to remain in their homes, no matter how modest those homes, in this case, single room occupancy hotels of, of 15 by 10 foot rooms with shared bathrooms. Um, but they also have a right to safety, affordability, freedom from harassment, freedom from unjustified eviction um, at a time uh, when there's pressure by developers to move the current population out in order to make room for upscale condos, same as Toronto. Um, but these quotes, they take us into the actual SRO landscape, specific hotels uh, that have been there for over a century, full of rooms occupied by downtown Eastside residents. Um, they're, and they're getting the posters into the building in order to recruit new tenant researchers. And we can hear in these quotes that there's passion, there's commitment, there's organization and active engagement as these people go around the buildings, as they marvel at the historical photos on the wall. Um, and I could also show you exchanges, similar exchanges about what happens when we bring residents into the archives and they're, they're rooting through musty boxes and files and records and old letters and photographs, something that very few people involved in the project could even have imagined themselves doing before we began. So a little bit of historic background. I've been working in the downtown east side for over 40 years now, especially along Powell Street, which was the historic uh, Japanese immigrant uh, district. Um, and uh, I've been involved in research for many years on a kind of architectural history of the particular building forms uh, that these ad old adapted houses and boarding houses took. I don't have time to talk about that, but of course, in the 1940s, the Japanese Canadian population was completely uprooted. Uh, about 8,000 8, people living right here and uh, 22,000 people throughout the rest of the province. Uh, there, the buildings were vacated, uh, but it, it was at that time the largest single pool, concentrated pool, a boarding house landscape um, in Canada. And of course, the buildings were uh, abandoned. They remained empty for many years. Uh, they became uh, the this very concentrated neighborhood landscape of SROs. Uh, so, of course, there's another whole sort whole social justice story to be told about Japanese Canadians that I won't talk about uh, tonight. I uh, been involved in that activism and I helped to negotiate the redress settlement in 1988. But we fast forward through a long history. If, if those of you who are familiar with Vancouver will know about the Strathcona struggle, about all of the things that have gone on since uh, especially the 1960s with the rise of citizens citizen activism in Vancouver and of course in other cities across Canada. Um, so our project, first of all, works directly with tenants to create support and activism around improving the quality of housing uh, in the SROs. We uh, help to create a local organization called the SRO Collaborative uh, and have, as a result, being able to leverage front funds through the collaborative um, to strengthen what's become an incredible network of researchers, activists, tenants, slash, slash, slash. Uh, and we use archives, public information, uh, art projects, including a museum installation, uh, music, a number of different uh, creative expressions uh, in order to get across the message on the one hand, but on the other hand, to get tenants involved 
in a project that is very much their own project. Uh, I am especially, especially excited and proud of this organization. I'm going to try to share the screen here for just a second. Hopefully, there you go. Is it there? Someone give me a. a yes, uh, it, it looks yeah. good, okay. Audrey, Yeah. Okay, okay. Uh, this is TORO, the Tenants Overdose Response Collaborative, uh, initiated through the SRO Collaborative. And this is tenants organizing to provide uh, both free Narcan and uh, training in administering the Narcan to SRO residents. Uh, and as a result of TORO, uh, depicted here in one of the many recent um, street art projects in the downtown east side, which are just absolutely phenomenal if you are ever able to travel to Vancouver and look at them. And within a year uh, the, of, of its founding, Toro had brought the opioid poisoning death rate down to the average for British Columbia, and that's from a neighborhood that had the highest death rate in Canada. Then came March 2020. Food banks closed, shelters closed, safe injection sites closed, uh, all shot down. Opioid poisoning sparked alarmingly. And in fact, opioid poisoning deaths were much higher than uh, COVID deaths. COVID didn't actually reach the downtown east side during the first wave, partly because of isolation, but partly because what I'm about to tell you about. Uh, but it became what some people have called a petri dish for COVID. People living in close proximity, sharing bathrooms, sharing uh, washing facilities in these very crowded and uh, run down buildings under conditions that are uh, absolutely unimaginable for most Canadians. But we had this team of people on the ground and our researchers immediately, I'll use the popular word of the day, pivoted um, to become what's called the COVID response team. And they began to distribute food, which was in short supply, water because the city had closed all the drinking fountains and all of the public washrooms, um, uh, PPE, sanitation supplies, and telephones. We got a grant for more than 100 telephones so that uh, tenants could keep in touch with each other and call for help uh, if they needed it. And ever since March, this response team has been working in the downtown east side and doing absolutely, uh, all I can say is absolutely heroic work uh, in order to uh, try and alleviate uh, the conditions. COVID actually has taken um, a stronghold uh, recently and the cases are going up, uh, but it's not nearly as bad as it might be. And although the opioid deaths have um, skyrocketed, they are not nearly as bad as they might be. Has my camera gone off or is it still okay? It's gone off on my screen. The camera's gone yeah, off. We yeah, we can't see you, unfortunately. Yeah. After How's the that? screen share. Yeah. Uh, oh, well, my face hasn't changed. I'll just keep going. <laughs> um, so I'll, I'm almost finished. I'll make a few points from an academic perspective. It's been very tough. Uh, for Jeff Masuda and myself, especially to be here in Kingston, the project is led through Queen's University, uh, to be watching at a distance in daily contact, of course, um, and and just so excited and delighted at, at what's going on to see the passion, the commitment, and the level of organization. And organization here is the key. Activism without organization doesn't really um, go very far. And just, uh, I'll make a few academic points, uh, that is a few research points that, that, uh, that you know, go into the literature in order to um, talk about what we're doing. First of all, participant research has many challenges, but it's remarkably effective. And when I say participant research, I mean genuine participant research in which everyone is there uh, sharing what they do on an equal basis. And we have a, a lot of things to do to say about uh, governance and uh, decision making, which I don't have time to go into. 
Um, next, participant researchers can do many things that academics themselves cannot do, including just being there on the ground, uh, being part of the network, knowing people. Listen to what I said at the beginning, so-and-so from that building and so-and-so from that building. These are people who meet on the steps of Carnegie um, Drop-In Center in order to share a smoke. Um, and it makes a huge difference, just being there to respond at a time of crisis. And the training that people received through Toro uh, transitioned very smoothly and very effectively into what was needed in order to deal with COVID. Uh, next, uh, participant researchers should never be underestimated. Perhaps I don't even need to say that. Uh, but they're a fount of talent and, acknowledge, and uh, knowledge and their experience really counts. In fact, uh, without their experience, we wouldn't be able to do much. And participant research can be effective in bringing about social change. The level of activism has, has been just remarkable and, and I can't begin to tell you how much I admire the activists on the ground who have lobbied and lobbied and lobbied, uh, whether that be working to get a a city councillor, Jean Swanson, in place so that she could um, follow up on a lot of issues, working directly with the provincial government, or picking up a mattress filled with rats and carrying it on their heads to City Hall and dumping it at the feet of City Council in order to try and, and get the City Council to listen. That's just one example of some of the things that have happened. Um, and uh, there have been some recent uh, really uh, important developments in terms of the city buying up properties, expropriating some of the worst properties owned by slum landlords. You may have followed some of this in the newspaper and recently making inroads with the provincial government. So again, I don't have time to talk about all of those things. Of course, just like Toronto, they've been slowed uh, by, by COVID. Um, but they're ready to ramp up again as soon as possible. So to conclude, I, I mentioned that poetry was one of the creative outputs of our organization of tenants. And it's, I, I wanted to demonstrate how we put all of this stuff together in a way. And the medium of poetry is haiku. This has been my own special personal project, so I thought I'd use this as one of many examples um, that we could use. Now, haiku, as I'm sure you know, is a Japanese uh, short poetic form, 17 syllables, but in Japan, it's often a vernacular oral tradition, usually among a small group of uh, five people. So we organized people into haiku circles um, that were simultaneously a creative force of expression, allowing people to to develop their expressive talents, um, but at the same time, uh, we're a way of linking people, of establishing networks, of creating friendships, and uh, those have uh, been tremendous. And we were just astounded at the response, at the number of people who got involved, who suddenly were writing wonderful things. Uh, so I am going to read to you to conclude uh, something that I have, uh, I wrote about half of it in order to create a story, uh, but, but most of the words actually come from the haiku that were created by tenant participants. It's called Place Where Maples Grew, uh, and that's a, a rough translation of the Indigenous name for the part of Vancouver um, at the foot of Dunleavy on Burrard Inlet facing north. Yeah, it's working. Okay, emojis. Uh, place where maples grow, the land of our ancestors faced the mountains once. Men and axes came, stripped the land, built the town that Vancouver became. Labor for the mills, Issei built the street of dreams, Pauerugai. Landscape, Dispossessed, government took all they'd built, left the building's shells. Oppenheimer Park, once the field of baseball dreams, all abandoned then, shattered dreams and lives. But now the SROs live on, denizens of hope. SRO hotels, once places of royalty, 
now catered to rats. Rats within the wall. I can't sleep, I can't sleep, I can't sleep, I can't sleep. Sirens fill the night. Urine on the floor, rot, blood, feces everywhere. How do I live here? Empty ownership. Today, short fingered sneak thief took my last clean shirt. No sunshine here, no fridge, no bath, shared toilets, not a home, a trap. Gray ra rain inside rooms. Landlords hear us, listen not, voices silence down. Eviction notice takes what little space I have. I'm not leaving here. Shovel breaks down door. Landlord crashes in my space. I'm still here and strong. Cast out in the night, living in a crowd of one, looking, reaching none. Trying to stay warm after midnight, cold, cold night, hoping to survive. Living on the street, how am I to live like this? I will find a way. Lost three friends tonight, fentanyl, the poison kills. Our lives are worth more. Missing women, girls, still their faces haunt these streets. Tossed and discarded. Sorrow fills my heart. Loss and loss and loss and loss. Light the sacred fires. Helpless and afraid, you tried to help your neighbors once but wonder where you went. Nothing I can sell. I've looked and there's not a thing. Please give me a break. Crowded confusion, stepping over a man tricked. We need some relief. Screaming down the hall. Toro's here, one small life saved. Now my own tears fall. Steps of Carnegie, share a smoke and friendship grows. Downtown East Side love. Collaborative. Share forgotten history brought to life today. Coffee, eggs, new friends speak. Long white table full of thoughts, thoughts into action. Broken pipes and walls, tenants learning human rights, repairs together. Homelessness shelter, community solutions, looking for housing. We must not be moved, fighting for a place, my home, standing together. Lost to history, remembered again today, legacy lives on. Haiku in the park, friendship circles thrive on hope. Fierce power our words. Make our voices heard, joining acts of courage, hope. Still the voices rise. Our strength moves forward, calling out for justice now. We need rent control. Tenants cooperate no matter what weather, minds work together. Many gave their lives so other could live, others could live their lives, remaining right here. Taking care of self, taking care of each other, community care, optimism, love, resilient community, the right to remain. Thank you. Thanks so much, Audrey. Um, our last speaker is uh, Geraldine Denning, uh, who is the co-founder and, uh, and director of Architects for Social Housing, or ASH. Um, a she's a practicing architect and senior lecturer at the Leicester School of Architecture. Recent projects with Architects for Social Housing include design and feasibility studies for additions and improvements to six council and social housing estates in London threatened with demolition. She has devised and coordinated Open Garden Estates, a series of events hosted by estates threatened with demolition. As Ash's lead architect, she is currently working with a number of housing cooperatives to explore new forms of community-led development. With Ash co-founder Simon Elmer, she's working on a book titled For a Socialist Architecture. Thanks so much, Geraldine, for joining us today from London at uh, 12.19, I think, in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Yes, hello, everyone. Um, it's great to be almost as close as I could get back in Canada. Uh, we were in Vancouver um, a year and a half ago. And so thank you so much to Asia in particular for inviting um, inviting me here. And uh, uh, and I really enjoyed the last two talks, particularly the, the haiku I thought was very 
powerful and it took me back to um, downtown east side which um, was an extraordinary place to have a privilege of, of spending time so i'm going to start today um, by introducing a little bit about who we are, um, the context in which we work, and specifically our alternatives to the demolition of council and social, or what you probably call public, housing estates in the UK, and our role as architects and other building industry professionals as agents in supporting existing residents to remain in their homes, but also to retain our social housing in the midst of a crisis of housing affordability. The image I'm showing here is a photo taken at our presentation to residents at St Raphael's Estate in Brent, northwest London, last February. The hands showing resident support for our work on the alternative to the demolition of their homes by Brent Council. Architects for Social Housing, so ASH, was set up in March 2015 in order to respond architecturally to London's housing crisis. I say London's housing crisis because this is predominantly but not exclusively the place in which we have worked but also because it's important to recognise that although the underlying economic mechanisms, as we discovered in our residency in Vancouver last year, are pretty much the same throughout the Western world right now, that of monopoly capitalism, the ways in which they manifest themselves locally are different. I don't have time today to discuss in detail the economic background to the current crisis to which our setting up was a response, but there is plenty of in-depth research in this area on our website if anybody's interested. So this is a map that we initiated at a residency in 2017 at the Institute for Contemporary Arts in London to locate and document every London estate under threat of, currently undergoing, or which has recently undergone regeneration. Whether that's through privatisation, that's typically what's called a stock transfer from public housing to a housing association, Refurbishment, usually with a prior decanting of the residents who in many cases do not return. Renoviction, as I believe it's known in Vancouver for certain. Or demolition, either partial or full, with the resulting loss of homes for social rent and the dispersal, or we call it social cleansing, of the existing estate community. So red pins indicate the 21 labour run boroughs, which by the time of the exhibition we had located 196 estates. Blue pins in the 10 conservative run boroughs, which had 37 estates and yellow in the Liberal Democrat run boroughs of Sutton, a total of 238 London estates in 2017, which has obviously increased considerably since that time. More than 165,000 homes for social rent were lost in England in just six years between 2012 and 2018, through a combination of estate regeneration schemes as shown in the previous slide, but also as a result of the right to buy your home from the public, a policy initiated by the Conservatives in 1980. Again, this figure is likely to be a massive underestimation, not least because we know that properties undergoing regeneration are not counted until the full regeneration is complete, and large estate regeneration schemes can take 20 years or more to complete, meaning thousands of homes would not be included in these figures. So ASH is a community interest company that organises working collectives of architects, urban designers, engineers, surveyors, planners, filmmakers, photographers, artists, writers and housing campaigners for individual projects. Tailored to meet specific needs, these collectives operate within uh, developing ideas under set principles. First among these is the conviction that increasing the housing capacity on existing council estates, rather than redeveloping them as properties for capital investment, is a more sustainable solution to London's housing needs than the demolition of the city's social housing during a crisis of housing affordability, enabling as it does the continued existence of the communities they house. Ash offers support, advice and expertise to residents who feel their interests and voices are marginalised by local councils or housing associations during the so-called regeneration process. Our primary responsibility is to existing residents, tenants and leaseholders alike, but we're also committed to finding financially, socially and environmentally viable alternatives to estate demolition that are in the interests of the wider London community. Practically, we propose architectural alternatives to estate demolition schemes. We support estate communities in the resistance to the demolition of their homes. And we share information that aims to correct unfounded statements and counter negative propaganda about social housing in the minds of the public with a view to initiating policy change. Over the past five years, we've worked with residents on seven council and social housing estates on alternatives to the demolition of their homes, which demonstrate that we can increase the density of the existing estates by up to 50% without any demolition or displacement. 
and that the funds from the sale or rent of a proportion of the new homes can fund the, the refurbishment of the existing homes, landscape and any necessary improvements to the community facilities. So from the top left to right, we've got Knight's Walk, which had, which is the first project we did with 33 homes, which forms part of a larger estate in South London. We have Central Hill Estate with 470 homes, also in South London. The Patmore Co-op on the right, an estate of 860 homes in South West London. West Kensington and Gibbs Green are two estates with 760 homes in West London. And Northwold, an estate with 580 homes in North East London. The seventh estate, um, St. Raphael's, uh, we haven't got images complete yet. So as part of the regeneration process, many residents on estates like this will be offered what is, what is known as a right to return, if not a right to remain. But what does that right actually mean once your home has been demolished? And why, if that is the case, do we need to design alternatives? As we discussed as part of our residency in Vancouver last summer, which is written up in our report for a socialist architecture, Rights are only as good as the legal frameworks they operate within and can be taken away in practice as quickly as they give, they're given in theory. The UN's right to housing does nothing to ensure either the affordability or security of tenure of that housing. All it does is provide the right to compete in the market free of discrimination, but does nothing to address the inequality of means in which that competition inevitably takes place. This example reveals the limits of human rights as a model for good governance and social justice. Human rights are a set of principles that don't take into account how they are implemented in practice through the legal system, which is subject to local economic and political pressures that tend to supersede those principles. The so-called right to return promise to residents living on these estates is only a right to return if you could afford it. And the economic reality is that the cost of demolition mean that the poorest residents who currently live on these estates will not be able to afford to return. For a socialist architecture is essentially a set of architectural practices and principles for operating under capitalism. If residents are to remain, the only way to guarantee that can happen is for their homes not to be demolished. Once your home has been demolished, no matter how, how many promises have been made, the proposed development will be subject to the developer's viability, and that means that any so-called rights will always be second to the developer's profit. So rather than starting from a theoretical position, the work of Ash is an immediate practical architectural response to urgent threats. Ultimately, the aim of our work is to demonstrate that it is more financially, socially and environmentally sustainable to refurbish and increase the density on these estates than to demolish them and displace or socially cleanse the inhabitants. The Central Hill estate in South London, for example, was threatened with demolition and redevelopment by the local authority Lambeth in 2014. Over the course of the following 18 months, we worked with residents to come up with a proposal to refurbish all 476 existing homes and landscape, re-provide the community centre, which is currently out of access to residents still, and build an additional around 200 new homes in both infill, which is in yellow, and roof extensions in pink. Ash's design proposals work in sympathy with the original design, ensuring that all the flats and maisonettes retain their views of London to the north and sun from the south and reinstated the green walkways which enabled pedestrian access throughout the estate. The new roof extensions are concentrated on the outer periphery of the estate, minimising any loss of light or view to the existing homes, with sawtooth profiles referencing the forms of some of the existing housing. Successful cities evolve gradually over time with their history and identity and cultural and social memory embedded in their architectural heritage. Neighbourhoods are no different, and it's important that we don't replicate some of the failures of the slum clearance programs of the past 100 years, that of the erasure of existing neighbourhoods and their communities, which unfortunately is what is happening again. A successful neighbourhood is one in which the occupying community has strong social ties and stability, economic security, a positive relationship with their environment, and agency in the ongoing maintenance and future of their homes is an essential element which can be introduced. Most of these things, except the governance, cannot be artificially created but must be given the right social, economic and environmental conditions and support to grow. Our report on Central Hill, which can be, you can find on our website in more detail, draws attention to the social and environmental arguments against demolishing the estate. But the only factor the council are interested in is the financial one, even though we know that environmental, social and health issues have significant financial implications. In order to demonstrate the economic viability of our proposals, we commissioned a quantity surveyor who calculated that we would be able to finance all the new build construction, refurbishment and improvements to the existing estate 
with the sale or rent on the private market of around half of the new homes. Those are in purple and black on the second line. So as a result, 64% of the eventual 718 new and refurbished dwellings would be for social rent, that's in red. The council's own full demolition proposal, on the other hand, seen at the bottom, would result in a loss of all the social rented homes. These would be effectively transferred to the London affordable rent, which is in orange, a rent which is approximately 60% higher than a social rent, an increase that those living on the estate simply can't afford, even if they were in a position to return to the estate once demolition and construction were complete. It's also it's important to realise that the redevelopment of the estate could take anything from 10 to 20 years or more to complete, as it has in cases such as the Hay Haygate estate in nearby Southwark, by which time residents have long since put down roots elsewhere. In terms of cost, our quantity surveyor estimated the proposal for refurbishment, new build and improvements would cost around £97 million in total, that's the top line. Assuming similar construction and other costs provided by the council, simply to demolish and rebuild the existing 456 homes would cost the council £156 million. And to match the same number as the Ash scheme, 718 homes, would cost them £254.5 million. It just doesn't stack up financially. Or environmentally, another argument we make that is becoming increasingly difficult for local authorities to ignore is that the environmental cost of demolition can no longer be ignored. We commissioned an environmental energy consultant who calculated that the carbon costs of the demolition of Central Hill Estate would be around 7,000 tonnes of embodied carbon. In addition, the demolition process itself would result in, a, in the loss of around 154 tonnes of embodied carbon. In an era of increased environmental awareness, it's inconceivable that these projects should be allowed to take place by councils who have in place sustainability charters of which these projects would surely be in contravention. This is an image of one of the projects we devised, Open Garden Estates, which was hosted by 15 estates across London over three years, from 2015 to 17. It's an opportunity for residents to open their estates, both to challenge existing stereotypes around housing, but also to help them organise their campaigns. In this case, a planting project as a way to assert their control over the landscape. This is an image of one of the, uh, sorry, no, this is uh, six years on now from the announcement to demolish the estate. And having spent over a million pounds on the proposals, the council plans have been completely scrapped and they've now gone back to the drawing board altogether. It's quite possible the council are nearer to moving forward with an infill plan such as the one we have proposed and that I have outlined here, although no actual master plan yet exists. In that time, the estate has been undergoing what we describe as managed decline. Only emergency repairs take place and so physical conditions on the estate are worsening rapidly. Temporary residents are moved in, squatters are occupying the temporary flat, the, the emptying flats for parties, making life miserable for the remaining residents. So many residents have taken offers to move off the estate, including many of the lead campaigners. There is still a campaign, however, and we are still hopeful. This is an image of the existing estate with our proposal for roof extensions above the stepped maisonettes to the right and the development of a small tower on the site of an old disused boiler house. West Kensington and Gibbs Green is another example, but one which has had greater success so far. I'll just cover this quite briefly. So again, here we work closely with the residents on the People's Plan, which identified the opportunity for an additional 327 new homes, in addition to the refurbishment of the existing uh, 760 homes and improvements again to the landscape and community facilities. So a 45% increase in housing capacity. This was achieved through roof extensions and winter gardens to the, the tower blocks and insulating cladding of the existing homes. New low rise extensions to some of the existing towers. And new community facilities, including a new single storey sheltered housing block looking out over play spaces to free up some of the larger unoccupied homes around the under occupied homes, sorry, around the estate for overcrowded families and the repurposing of two small garage spaces to workshops. One of the key elements present in this campaign, which was absent in Central Hill, was the formalisation of the community campaign constitutionally into a community land trust, West Kensington and Gibbs Green Community Homes, embedding with it a set of governance structures for the campaign and the ongoing development process, which was intrinsic to the campaign success. Following the completion of the People's Plan, the estates, which were previously sold, had already been sold by the local authority as part of a much larger redevelopment project to the developer Capco, 
were returned to the council, successfully defeating the threat of demolition by the developer. The residents are now in the process of making applications to transfer the estate into community ownership. The first application was in fact rejected by the Secretary of State in 2019 on the grounds that removing the estates from local authority or public ownership would have a significant detrimental effect on the provision of housing services or the regeneration of the area. This raises the question, the question specifically of the relative merits of public ownership in the form of the local authority versus community ownership in the form of the resident CLT. We would always maintain that public ownership in theory is the best in terms of retention and provision of the most needed low cost properties for rent with the responsibility that they have in theory to their resident population. In reality, however, we are increasingly seeing a blurring of lines between public and private sectors, whereby the provision of new housing is only achieved through the transfer of the land out of public ownership to a private housing association, which does not have the same level of scrutiny or obligation to the wider community resulting in the overwhelming loss of social housing. The security which public housing once used to offer has been removed. The only way for the residents of West Kensington and Gibbs Green to guarantee they can remain and retain control over their homes is through taking it out of the so-called public sector into community ownership. This has understandably opponents who argue that it is a form of privatisation by the back door, not that dissimilar to housing associations and is only as good as its government structures and the people involved. In the current economic climate, the ability, if not the right, for residents to remain in their homes is entirely dependent upon preventing demolition. Remaining, as we have argued, is an economic, social and environmental concern. And while we operate within a capitalist economy, it needs to be understood and addressed specifically in these terms, or it will simply be found unviable, and those communities depending upon it will simply cease to exist. Finally, I'd like to reinforce that we are all agents of a socialist architecture resident, planner, architect, neighbour, politician, and it's up to us to use the skills that we have to envision and help bring about the world we want to live in. Architecture is always political. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Geraldine. So thanks to all three of our speakers. Um, that was, there was our incredible contributions to this conversation. And I'm wondering, Mona, do you want to start with a question? Uh, yeah, I'm also wondering, given the time, there's 20 minutes left uh, in this session, um, whether we just want to open it up to the audience right away, or um, should we ask a couple of questions to start? So I'm trying to unshare my screen. I don't seem to be able to do that. For some reason. <laughs> <laughs> you should. Can you click the share tray button? That doesn't work. Yeah, I've done that and then I'm kind of stuck. <laughs> Got it. Continue. Well, yeah. It's a nice slogan for us to talk around. <laughs> oh, here we go. Oh, no. oh there we not. go. There we go. Stop presenting. There we are. <laughs> well, we have one question for Yogi. So maybe, I mean, if, if, I, if nobody has their hand up currently, um, please feel free to put your hand up if you'd like to ask a question or um, put a put a question in the chat. Um, maybe, uh, Jennifer, I don't know if you want to read out your question or should I read it out? Um, yes, I can read it out. Great. Hi. Hi, I'm Myers. Uh, so, uh, so Yogi, uh, I was really inspired by your, uh, by your anecdote of a, of a local project in the Toronto area where architecture students were able to, where architecture students and other and other and many other people were able to, able to get together and develop and and just create their own opportunities from scratch. And I really definitely felt like the sense of there aren't many opportunities to create social housing for architecture students nowadays. So I was wondering, like, if if for other architecture students who want to find these opportunities, what would you suggest? I almost feel like Adrian or Mona might be better placed to answer such a question. I mean. Um, for us, the way it came together was that we initially approached Adrian because uh, we had heard about some of the other projects Adrian had worked on in order to bring architects and those working in the field of architecture together for uh, building in support of public housing. And then it was Adrian who connected us with Mona and the Open Architecture Collaborative. And that coalition came together. Uh, as a result, and in this instance, worked quite well to create a model that 
um, provided a vision for how that neighborhood could be transformed. But I don't know uh, further uh, than that. So maybe the two of you, Adrian or Mona, might know better about where people can find such spaces. Um, I mean, yeah, I would just echo the sentiment that currently we're not operating in a context where um, these opportunities are common. Um, so, I mean, I think um, these days, given uh, the housing crisis and what's happening around COVID, there's been a lot of, um, I guess, P architects and um, designers kind of taking off their strictly architecture and designer hat and uh, as Audrey mentioned just kind of working alongside uh, people um, unhoused people or people um, in precarious housing situations and seeing asking the questions of what is it immediately needed um, and how can we help um, whether through what doing things in the short term um, or advocating for broader um, like more systemic political change so I think that was one of my questions that I had um, pri uh, before this event is whether um, the speakers can maybe talk about how uh, your experiences in moving from um, sort of these uh, practical and immediate solutions um, to address the problems of uh, displacement and homelessness and how those smaller um, actions can lead to uh, like broader uh, systemic change that's needed. Um, maybe I, I can just say a couple of things there. Uh, on on the one hand, I wanted to mention that, you know, there are so many opportunities for people to volunteer to help out with in Vancouver. It would be with the SRO Collaborative. Uh, what they don't need is a whole bunch of students kind of descending with a missionary kind of attitude. Uh, but a lot of our students have been working in the area and they're uh, doing a lot of the work that's requiring that's required every day, just st stock taking and delivering and running around and doing things uh, as well as working with Toro. Um, so uh, they require to be trained, however, and they be require to have a little bit of humility in their training because it's a setting that they're not accustomed to. But then moving beyond that every day, uh, it's been before COVID, uh, and let's um, just leave COVID aside for now because it's going to go away. Um, but before COVID, we were beginning to see some cracks. The provincial government is shifting, um, maybe more so than the Ontario government. The city council is shifting. Uh, the most important thing, however, is to have facts ready to fill right into those slots, those op small openings that are created uh, by shifting political attitudes. And it, you know, if a politician or a policymaker uh, signals that they're ready to do something, then those of us on the ground and those of us who know the situation better be ready with facts, with proposals, with actually concrete suggestions about how it's going to be done. Okay, thank you. Um, Geraldine, would you like to jump in? Sure, yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah, sure. Um, I think it's a really, it's a really important question, and I think it's one we're often asked, um, both on the two sides, like A, what can I do uh, on a practical level, but then B, you know, what, how can we, yeah, create a kind of broader change? And I suppose, in a way, um, we were reluctant to wait around for politics to change. You know, I mean, we could be waiting forever for the bigger political system to move. And we feel that it's through these smaller projects that we do, through the practical work, that change will come about. Um, rather than having to potentially rely on 
big policy changes, which obviously are the things that in the end will allow us to have the funding that we need to provide the kind of housing that we need, you know, internationally. Um, but in order to get there, I think the sort of the everyday work is the political work in a sense. Um, and so I think it's only through demonstrating these things on a very practical level, exactly like both of the other speakers are doing. I think it's through those acts that change will come about. Um, and although that sounds kind of slightly paradoxical, because in a way, a lot of the things we're trying to achieve can't be achieved without political change. I still think we're in this kind of strange um, middle ground in which in order to facilitate change, we need to make that change happen ourselves through the practical work that we do. And I think that's whether we're architects, whether we're operating within policy, whether we're planners, whether, we, uh, whether we're residents, everybody has some sort of form of, uh, of, of agency. Um, and I think it's, it's really important that we all try and do every little bit that we can, rather than it having to be coming down to politics and policy. And I think in a way that's always the, um, what we all think of as being the, 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 the only way to achieve change is through these bigger structures doing it for us. But um, I just think we'd, we're we not going to be here if we wait for that. We have to make the things happen in whatever capacity we have some kind of uh, control and agency over um, um, in the environments that we're in. If that answers the question. Well, yeah. uh, I know that nonprofits are pretty important in, that, in this case. Thank you. Maybe I could ask a question. Um, one of the central problems of housing is the speculative nature of the land market. The very concept of the right to remain contradicts the fundamental logic of any speculative market, that it involves the circulation of land as a commodity and rests on its alien ability, the ability to sell the land. Um, does any struggle for the right to remain lead to criticism of the fee simple property right and a proposition of alternative approaches to the use of land? And I think that problem emerged in an interesting way in Geraldine's talk, um, but also I think in an interesting way in Yogi's talk around the question of expropriation and Geraldine's around the question of the CLT. Um, and Audrey and yours, it didn't jump out at me, but uh, but obviously the, ha the haiku <laughs> talks about it in different ways, but maybe each of you could comment, I don't know, on that question. Thanks. Um. If I may start, um, it's absolutely right that the question around expropriation especially got a lot of people riled up. A lot of people were, were in support of the idea of this vacant housing being taken up. But the notion that here is a property owner who in people's minds is going to be uh, somehow lose this uh, investment that they had made was really shocking to a lot of people. And it's often a question that was posed in, I'm sorry, I don't know why my phone keeps doing that, it's off. <laughs> Jesus, sorry about that. It's connected to this computer somehow, anyway. Um, but the question was often made, it was like, so if you talk about expropriation, does that mean the person just lose access to their land? And of course, in case of expropriation, that's not what it actually means. It means the government forces a sale. But I think you're absolutely right. At the crux of the housing problem is this notion that housing can be treated and is treated, in fact, as a commodity to buy and sell and to make profit off of, as opposed to a place where people can live. And I think uh, creating communal housing, social housing, public housing, changes that notion in so many fundamental ways where housing is considered a need and people have access to it for the duration that they need it. And I think that does go against the logic of this market-based housing, which is why I think there's substantial opposition to it under our current system. But it's also an emphasis point for us to push forward with. I think it absolutely has to be taken out of a free capitalism control. Uh, now, maybe that can also occur on a larger scale, but in those parts of the city where there is need for uh, for low cost housing, it absolutely has to be uh, public or a similar. There, there are different models of 
private SROs that are well run. There are models of co-ops that have worked fairly well. In the case of Vancouver, there were two infamous hotels, two of the largest, the Regent and the Balmoral, uh, that became very famous because the city did expropriate them. They recently gave the, the notorious slum landlords um, a payment. Um, it's secret, so I don't know if it was fair market value. Uh, but it was certainly low uh, if it was. Um, and the city has to buy up properties. The province can buy up properties. There have to be public funds available for renovation. And there has to be rent control, rent control, rent control, and uh, public standards. Yes, I, th I think. Um... I think you're absolutely right. I mean, when we talk about what can we do, ultimately, yes, take the land out of uh, um, uh, speculation. Yeah, take it out off the market. And that, in a sense, is what the Community Land Trust does. So, again, when I sort of talk about, you know, the bigger picture is, yes, all housing, all land should be, uh, uh, should be uh, 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 public. Then in a small level, let's see how can we do this on a case by case basis. You know, it is possible to uh, uh, for a community land trust to purchase land and to develop that land. Um, and that is what the, the residents at the West Kenna Gibbs Green were planning to do with a long term uh, uh, you know, business plan. You know, housing is profitable, even social rented housing. If you look at like a 50 year plan, you know, the social housing is the most stable form of housing. The lowest rents are absolutely are utterly stable. Uh, and if you're looking at getting investments from things like pension funds, whatever, looking at very, very slow, very small returns over a very long time, people like those kinds of very safe, sure investments. So it's definitely possible. And I think the more we can demonstrate uh, uh, you know, the possibility of those kind of processes, then the, the, the more it catches on. I mean, in Germany, something like 30 percent, I think, uh, of their housing is provided by housing co-ops. Um, and they have uh, really interesting systems where co-ops are lending money to each other. I forget the German name for it now. And in Vancouver, I think there was a very interesting organization which was a sort of form of cooperative CLT. Um, so it was a community land trust, a large sort of organization which was a community land trust, which meant the land was taken out of the market, but the co-ops were what managed the individual pieces of land, the individual housing estates within that and I can't remember the name of British Columbia Housing Cooperative or something like that um, really innovative actually in terms of the way in which they um, related um, the community land trust to to the housing co-ops and I think that's definitely going to be the way to go and I think that is something which you know individual groups of people can do um, so again it's sort of thinking what can we do without waiting for the government central government local authorities to do it for us and these are some of the ways in which we can uh, we can we can act. Uh, obviously, you need money and we need funding, um, but there are organisations and things like pension funds and things like that, which are starting to fund, you know, community shares and starting to fund sort of community based projects. So, um, yes, I think that ultimately the goal is <laughs> take them, take all of the housing and uh, land out of the market. But in the in the meantime, we can do it in a more piecemeal way and take control back uh, to the communities that way. The only issue in Vancouver, if I can respond briefly, uh, is that A, it's very limited and the hope is that it will increase. They're not exactly cooperatives, but um, they operate like cooperatives and they're run by nonprofits who have uh, varied reputations and a lot of questions about the way they run. Yes, I think it's always going to come down to, in those cases, that there's much less scrutiny and transparency as there would be for public housing. So, yes, you're right, there's, there, there, there's going to be good ones and bad ones, and that's, um, that's always going to be a problem. Whereas with the public housing, you think that's much more, there's more security there, you would, you would expect. But um, at the moment, that's, that in itself is, is really uh, up, you know, in doubt, I'd say. I think it's in doubt in Canada as well. I mean, I think governments are selling off so much of the public housing land um, in the last over the last 20 years. And so, yeah, the idea that the, the public housing or, or land in the public holding is more secure than something like a CLT um, is not necessarily the case. Mona, did you want to ask a last question? We don't have any new questions in the chat. Uh... Yeah, I had kind of a 
concluding question that I wanted to ask everyone um, since uh, there's a platform for this. Um, yeah, so what would be one action that each of you uh, would recommend um, people, everyone here who's here um, listening uh, to do to uh, make a contribution to the fight for the right to remain? I can, I can go first if that's uh, if you're waiting. Um, uh, I, I remember this was asked of me actually um, um, quite a few years ago when I was giving a talk at a kind of uh, a huge um, corporate event. Um, and I don't imagine that any of the people in that half of the people in that room would never have come anywhere near a council estate. Um, so I don't know if this action, how relevant it is to your uh, uh, to the people at this talk, but um, would be to get to know your local area um, and to understand as much as possible the uh, uh, the opportunities and the issues, the problems that are being faced by that area. This goes back to Yogi's um, talk, which was about the fact that um, it wasn't just about supporting other people's um, uh, uh, campaigns, but it was about looking at where you are. Ash actually started because I'm, I live on the, a council estate, and it was actually the first project we did was on the uh, on my own estate. The place that you live in um, is the one that you're going to know the best. And in the going back uh, to Audrey's comment about uh, you know tenant researchers, if you live there, if you are also a resident as well as being uh, you know an architect, an academic, a researcher. Um, it gives you a very different kind of perspective. So it's really about not necessarily the place, the immediate house that you live in, but the, the surrounding area and to see if you can get involved in any way of campaigns that are happening in that area. And the knowledge that you bring to that being a local uh, will be enormously valuable. Uh, getting informed is very important. I could describe to you situations where uh, people ask me what we're doing and I tell them, and they'll say, oh my God, you work in the downtown east side. I won't even go there. It is so scary. Uh, so actually we can do a lot just to educate people that actually know it's not a scary place. I go there all the time by myself. Um, uh, but also uh, people can get to know their uh, city council and express their political views, express their opinions, write letters. Uh, there are lots of things that can be also done at, at a greater distance that uh, and then you can vote uh, when there's a municipal or a provincial or even a federal election. Get out there and vote for the party that has a strong platform on social housing. I, I really like uh, what both, both what Geraldine and Audrey said uh, around engaging not only in professional capacity, many of you will become um, professionals and will operate as such, but also in your in your personal lives. I mean, uh, each of us has agency. Each of us is aware of what's happening in our neighborhood. I mean, especially these days where there are encampments and tents popping up in different intersections. I'm sure it's happening in the cities that uh, many of you are living in. It's certainly happening in the city. It's certainly happening in Toronto. It's certainly happening in the city where I live in now. Uh, what are your local neighborhood associations saying about some of that stuff? A lot of neighborhood associations, which are really property owners associations, tend to be quite regressive and tend to really put forward ideas that talk about pushing poor and homeless people out of a neighborhood, to talk about encouraging gentrification. And those are things that I think all of us can play a part in uh, taking a position on and then taking action on as well. And in, in many of your cases, you will have professional uh, degrees as architects and will pursue work in that field. And there are many inspiring examples. Uh, certainly some of the work that Geraldine's talked about is very inspiring. The work, in my opinion, that Mona did and that Adrian's doing, uh, both of them are doing, I mean, is quite inspiring because it's using that training and it's putting it to use uh, for the public good in very tangible and concrete ways. And that is, is, is quite valuable uh, contribution, I think, to social movements. And can I can I add one more? I I don't think the charity model works in the bigger picture, or, and and I'm not terribly supportive of it. But and especially right now, when you talk, about, there are many people living on the streets. There are many pop up tents. You know what? Find out what's needed and show up with a car full of food. 
uh, we had all kinds of donations coming in uh, to the downtown east side and they were very well appreciated, although sometimes they weren't uh, very appropriate for the needs uh, of the people who were going the, for whom they were intended. So find out what's needed, make sure it's appropriate and 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 just show up and take take the stuff that's needed. Can I also jump in again? Sorry, it's <laughs> making me think um, that the, the, uh, one of the reasons why uh, um, some of our work was effective was precisely because, as Yogi said, as architects, you have an authority. So the residents were complaining to council, were refused, to, to, but they weren't being listened to. And as soon as we turned up, we're like, oh, well, we're architects. It meant the council had to listen to us. Um, you know, whether or not, whatever you, whatever you think of that authority, you have certain skills and you, and it's, and it's a kind of duty to take, uh, to use the position that you have, to use the authority, to use the privilege, whatever you want to call it, that you have and, and do whatever you can with that. Um, and I think that's what we really recognised was that residents could only go so far, both in the, the in the, the kind of communications they were having with the council. So. I would really, you know, really, uh, really understand the extraordinary skills and talents that you have, you will all have, um, and make the most of them, including um, trying to convince clients. You know, you will all be in a position sometimes to have clients who are, you know, on one or other level, either supportive or not of what you're doing. But it's absolutely your responsibility to educate clients. Um, because ultimately they're potentially the ones with the money. And I think that's a really, really big job that um, architects can have a really, you know, can be very powerful and can uh, 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 can achieve a lot through doing that. I think it's very important. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think these are great insights for how architecture can operate very differently from how it typically operates today. Um, so that's much appreciated. I think it's um, just after eight o'clock. So um, I think maybe we should call it a close. Uh, thanks so much, uh, Yogi, Audrey, and uh, Geraldine for sharing your experiences, your expertise, and for inspiring us to think about how we can act uh, politically around issues of housing uh, as architects. Thank, thank you so, so much. much. Yes, thank you. Thanks so much for inviting me. Really, thank you. <laughs>